Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret, and today we're in Mark chapter 9, verse 49. <clears throat> Excuse me. Working on a cold here. Working on getting rid of it. Mark 9, 49. And uh, we'll begin in a minute. I'll give you a minute to get your Bible, hopefully. Also, give me time to remind you that the Scripture Verse by Verse website is found at thebibleversebyverse.com. You can choose, click, listen. It's all you need to do. All you need to bring is your Bible to thebibleversebyverse.com. And Father, we pray that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Mark 9, 49. For everyone, Jesus said, everyone shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Salt is, in Scripture, salt is a type of the Word of God. And if a sacrifice is truly one which God will accept, that it must be based on the Word of God. Anything that we do for God must be, must be in line with Scripture or He will not accept it as being something good. And Jesus goes on, he continues in verse 50, salt is good, but if the salt have lost its saltness, with what will ye season it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace one with another. Yeah, once salt loses its saltiness, it's useless. That's the only thing it's good for. Salt is a picture of the Word of God in the Bible, like I said. So what Jesus is saying is, live by the Word of God, abide by the Word of God, then you're going to be like salty salt. But if you walk away from truth, if you walk away from the authority of Scripture, the sufficiency of Scripture, you are going to be like saltless salt. In other words, good for nothing. Because salt, once it loses its saltiness, is good for nothing. You can't grow anything in it. You can't put salt crystals on a ring. It's not pretty. It's useless. And if a Christian loses his holiness and his reliance on the Word of God, he becomes useless too. Saltless salt. So don't allow that to happen. The choice is yours. The choice is mine. Now let's go into chapter 10. And he arose from there and cometh into the borders of Judea by the farther side of the Jordan. And the people resort unto him again. And as was his custom, he taught them again. Jesus just loved to teach the word of God. I know what that's like. He loved to teach the word of God. He did every chance he got. He was always teaching. He never missed an opportunity. No matter how tired he was, he never missed an opportunity. If somebody wanted to learn, Jesus would teach them, which is exactly what's going on right here. Verse 2, And the Pharisees came to him and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife, testing him? Well, there they are again, these snakes. <clears throat> the, <clears throat> excuse me. The Pharisees were testing Jesus with this question about divorce. It was a very sticky issue back in those days. Their question is, can a man put away or divorce his wife 
for any reason at all. 3. And he answered and said unto them, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses permitted a man to write a bill of divorcement and to put her away. Jesus says, what does God say? They want to know his views on divorce specifically. And Jesus says, well, what does God say? And they said, well, God permitted divorce, which was true. Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 3 teaches that very clearly. God permitted divorce. If there was a problem, then the man could write a divorce paper, make it official, and that would be it. The marriage would be over. That's right in the word of God. But look at verse 5. And Jesus answered and said unto them, For the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. In other words, Jesus said God allowed divorce, but it wasn't his perfect will for man. God allowed divorce because sometimes it's the lesser of two evils. It's never a good thing, but sometimes it is the lesser of two evils. Six, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. So then they are no more two but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. So Jesus is saying that, uh, yes, there are times when God permits divorce. But if you want to know what God's will is, if you want to know what his perfect will is, it's that every marriage should last a lifetime. Verse 10. And in the house, his disciples asked him again of the same manner. The disciples have a follow-up question on the subject of divorce, and we're going to find out why. Look at verse 11. And he saith unto them, Whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another committeth adultery against her. In other words, if you divorce your partner, your husband or your wife, and it's not for biblical reasons, and you marry somebody else, then that person commits adultery, and you commit adultery when either of you remarry. Because God doesn't recognize that that first marriage was dissolved. 12. And if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she committeth adultery. In other words, it works both ways. For the husband and the wife, doesn't matter. It's not just a a rule for the husband, it's a rule for the for the wife as well. Thirteen. And they brought young children to him, that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. The disciples didn't want Jesus to waste his time, according to their thinking messing around with children because they thought that children were insignificant. That was generally accepted. As a matter of fact, back in those days, children were insignificant. Don't bother Jesus with children. 14. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased And said unto them, Permit the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Jesus was always welcoming children. And any time that they wanted to be with him, he was ready. Jesus says that's what the kingdom is. The kingdom of heaven is made up of little children. In other words, people with childlike attitudes and childlike faith in God. And Jesus is also making it clear 
that children who die before the age of accountability go to heaven, whether they're baptized or not, it doesn't matter. That is a man-made religious rule to suggest that a little infant or a little child, before they reach the age of accountability, whatever it is for that person, goes to hell or Catholic Church limbo, which is completely concocted as a church rule. 15. <clears throat> Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter into it. And this is Jesus' point. The disciples were trying to keep the children from coming to Jesus, but Jesus, in essence, is saying, you better look at the children and learn a lesson from them. Instead of looking at them with disdain, you should look at them and learn something from their childlike faith. You know, when a, an adult tells a child something, they believe them. And when God tells us something, we should believe him. That's childlike faith in God. We, we should, when God tells us something in his word, we should just believe him because that's how we get into the kingdom of heaven. Believe the word of God. Believe the word of God, which says that Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins. Believe the word of God, which says that he rose from the dead on the third day, proving that his sacrifice on the cross was good. It worked. Believe the word of God, which says that if you repent and receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you become a child of God. When you do that, you are acting with childlike faith, and that's how you get into the kingdom of heaven. You know, <clears throat> being saved has nothing to do with the complexities of religion. And religious attitude, it just comes down to childlike faith. Just believe what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say anything about religion when it comes to being saved. It says, repent and receive Jesus Christ. To as many as received him, to them he, became, he gave the right to become the children of God. And you can't really receive him. You don't really receive him unless you repent because if you don't repent, you're not sincere. And one thing God does demand is sincerity when praying to receive Christ. So that's how you get into the kingdom of heaven. In verse 16, And he took them up in his hands, or in his arms, put his hands upon them, and blessed them. So Jesus received these little children, and he blessed them. What a thrill it must have been for these little ones to be blessed by Jesus himself. And what a thrill for the parents as well to see this happen. And we'll stop right there today. Study all of God's word with me at the Bible, verse by verse dot com. Choose, click, listen. Four complete series, going on five, all archived at the Bible, verse by verse dot com. All there for you. All you need to bring is your Bible and a hunger for God's word to the Bible verse by verse dot com and you're all set. If you'd like to be a part of Scripture verse by verse, you can be by praying for me and praying for God's word. As a matter of fact, why don't you do it right now? It's fresh in your mind. Just say a prayer for me and God's word. I'd appreciate that. And please continue doing that whenever you think of it. Also, another way to be a part of this ministry is when you take a break from studying with me at the Bible, versebyverse.com, go to the front page, click the donate button, and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead, because that also makes you a part of this ministry. I'd appreciate both of those things. Until next time, Michael Moret for Scripture Verse by Verse. So long, everyone.